now we're we're live and uh, it's it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, our guest speaker today john lomberg who is a visual artist and a science journalist who specializes in outer space he was a longtime collaborator of carl sagan starting i think with the illustrations for sagan's book uh Cos the cosmic connection in 1972 and of course he was uh one of the figures behind the influential series Cosmos, the science fiction uh, contact. And we know him as uh, one of the specialists on the team that created the Golden Record. And so it's a, special, um, it's a special pleasure to welcome you here today. But of course, Lomberg has also received commissions from the Smithsonian Institution and from NASA. And if you find yourself on Oahu Island in Hawaii, make sure you visit the Galaxy Garden, park and a maze in the shape of the, of the Milky Way that Lomberg created for the um, Pailaku Peace Garden Sanctuary. He is the recipient of too many awards to list here, but I just want to mention one thing. He has an asteroid named after him, um, formerly known as asteroid 6446-1990QL is now known as asteroid Lomberg. Please join me in welcoming John Lomberg. Over to you, John. Thank you, Alex. And thank you so much for in inviting me to speak to your class. Let me see if I can get my... Here we go. Well, I'm here to talk about the golden record and interstellar music to an audience that at least I can see some of you it's challenging to create something for an audience that you can't see and in fact don't even know exists, but that was in fact the challenge we faced. And even though I'm going to talk mostly about the music, in space, even music doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, in the sense that if we had sent only music, if we had sent a record that had only music and the needle to play it, I think it would have been a much more enigmatic and mysterious object to whoever found it. Uh, in a sense, the function of the rest of the record is to explain what the music is. So today I'm going to talk a bit about the pictures as well. Because it's the pictures that really show who made the music and maybe even how they made it. What the golden record is, is really an art piece. It's the, uh, it's the only part of the spacecraft that doesn't have a mechanical or uh, science or engineering function. It's, uh, it's cargo and therefore it must be a gift. It's either a gift or some kind of ceremonial object. And the fact that there are playing instructions on the box, we hope implies that this is something that we want whoever finds it to experience. And if they get that, even if they get nothing else, that this object was intended for them, that may be the most powerful message of all. I think of Voyager, the Voyager mission as a symphonic suite of dances scored for an orchestra of planets, moons, and two spacecraft. The launches were the overture, followed by two movements as each spacecraft danced past Jupiter, and then two more movements at Saturn, and then a solo for one spacecraft flying past Uranus and Neptune. When we made the record, nobody knew that Voyager would become one of the greatest missions of all time, maybe NASA's crowning achievement, uh, apart from landing on the moon that would really show us that outer realm of the solar system that we knew only as fuzzy, vague dots. And now they became worlds, each with their own personality. It was a truly a heroic symphony, the best heroica since Beethoven. And then following the, uh, the trip through the solar system, each spacecraft left the realm of the planets uh, around our sun to wander forever in the Milky Way galaxy. And, and here's a painting I did, originally a commission for the Smithsonian. Most of the art you'll see in this presentation is mine. Uh, our solar system is one of many billions of stars in a flat disk of stars called a, a galaxy. Our galaxy is called the Milky Way galaxy. We're not in the center 
we're almost in the center of the painting though, uh, around here in this object called the Orion arm, these blue dots represent 1% uh, of the exoplanets discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope. And similarly, most of the other objects, uh, at least near the sun, are, uh, are correct and in their correct position. But I have to say, in terms of the scale, if you look at this cross marking our position, and you look at the very center of the cross, every star you can see in the sky with the naked eye at night will be under the center of that cross. Now, that's an enormous volume but it's very small in terms of the overall galaxy. So these spacecraft are going on an essentially endless trip around the galaxy, and we'll talk a little more about the destination later. Well, if it was a symphony, then Golden Record was a very, very long coda that Carl Sagan was asked to be the guest conductor for. And that coda, the golden record, is kind of the end of the symphony that never really ends. It fades away endlessly, almost like the end of the Beatles album, Sgt. Pepper. And two identical records are attached on each spacecraft, packed inside this box. And the box contains the instructions for how you take the enclosed cartridge and stylus and put it on the record top and side view how it's played and how the pictures are to be decoded. I won't go into details. It's already ancient history for us. It was made in 1977 when MASH and All in the Family were the hit TV shows and Star Wars was a brand new hit movie. Almost immediately, it had its role in, in popular culture appearing in movies like Starman and Star Trek where it was the infamous V'ger and then featuring on TV shows, many, many of them comedies like The Big Bang Theory and Futurama, both of which had uh, episodes devoted to the golden record. And it's even appeared in the concert hall as part of uh, the Kronos Quartet's Sound of Space inspired by the Voyager missions. When I was in Finland, uh, I was given a cake with a golden record on it. And last Christmas brought some wonderful Christmas cookies. And uh, I even had requests for a, for a tattoo. Let me, getting ahead of myself there. Even 43 years later, they're still making uh, movies about uh, the Voyager record. This was a recent movie. And what struck me about it is that everything they said about the record was wrong. How it was made, who made it, what was on it. But in a sense, none of that mattered because they got it. They got the core idea of it. And Mark Twain wants to find a classic as a book that uh, everyone praises, but nobody reads. And the golden record is something like that. Everybody has heard of it. And most people have a positive impression of it, even though very few people know what was actually on it. But it's bookended my life. Here's a picture of me with uh, some of the people who worked on the record at the launch in 1977, and then a more recent picture of me at the 40th anniversary with my, with my wife and son at the premiere of uh, one of the best documentaries made about the mission, a movie called The Farthest. So how many things from 1977 are we still talking about? Would we still be talking about Star Wars without all the sequels? And who talks about MASH and All in the Family anymore? So what explains the enduring nature of this project? And I think it's because everyone can connect with it. Scientists are very interested in learning the composition of Callisto's crust. One of the you know, Voyager scientific achievements, but that doesn't really interest anybody else. But if you say we're going to send a, uh, a message describing the Earth, everybody can understand what that means. And when they look at our picture of the father and child, we think everybody will understand why that picture was chosen and what that picture represents. I just as everybody would agree that sending a picture of our home planet would be a, would be a good thing to do. So it's accessibility. Uh, and also the fact that one of the ground rules that, that Carl and Frank Drake, uh, the two heads of the project made was that this was not a message from NASA or the United States. This was a message from the world. 
So the contents should reflect the whole world, not just one nation, even though we're the nation that, that made it. I think another reason for its popularity is that most news is bad news. Here's a scene from orbit of the plumes from the wildfires in Florida this, uh, this past uh, season. And we hear about wars and all the terrible things that people do to one another. And then we have these new crises uh, of, uh, of a medical nature. Well, we didn't send any pictures like that on the record. Another one of the ground rules that Sagan and Drake laid was that let's be remembered for what's good about us, not for uh, what's bad about us. So we didn't send this picture either. Let's be remembered for Mozart, not for a mushroom cloud. And Mozart, by the way, is of all the things that I contribute to the record, I think what I'm proudest of is uh, getting Mozart on. But let's be remembered for how we can move with grace and beauty. And figuring out how to do that in the one photograph we had available was, was tricky. I thought this was a nice solution. Or let's be remembered for our, our love of sport, uh, competing on an equal field, uh, all the different uh, colors of, of humanity, uh, emphasizing the global nature of our, of our message. CNN Sports had an online story that you can still uh, read about these two photos where they interviewed uh, the gymnast Kathy Rigby and the Russian sprinter Valerie Bortsov about what, how it felt to be part of this message. Let's be remembered for doing something very difficult or something gently beautiful in Bali. As beings who are curious about our origins, who make fire, and who make art. Above all, let's be remembered for music. And we have two photos that I put in to explicitly try to tell E.T. what music is. And the fact that these two pictures are the last two pictures in the sequence should indicate this is something that's a supreme accomplishment, our best achievement. It's not in with the farming and the cooking and the building. It's something so special that we devoted most of the record to it. And what we hope is that, especially in the case of stringed instruments, the principle of form follows function may help understand what they are. In fact, uh, one of the reasons Carl asked me to be part of the team was that he and I had spoken for years about how music might or might not be useful in interstellar communication. He sent me a paper by a radio astronomer named Sebastian von Herner, who argued that a lot of the basic of music, especially harmony, dissonance, and the divisions of the octave are not arbitrary, but are, uh, are driven by, by physics. The overtone series of a vibrating string is not something we have any control over. And a vibrating string on Mars will have the same overtone series as it will on the Earth. And in fact, a lot of our uh, basic concepts, at least in Western music, of, uh, of harmony, of chords, of, may, of triads, base, are based on the overtone series of a vibrating string. So if sound, if the uh, arrangement of pitches is somehow of any kind of interest to another being, they're going to confront some of the same issues in sound that we do and uh, their response may in some ways be analogous to ours. We follow these two pictures uh, with the actual music that's being shown in the score here. It's from uh, the Beethoven late quartet, the Cavatina movement. And you hear the snatch of music that's, that's being shown in the score immediately after this. And since music is a language where the rising pitches are mirrored in the rise and, des and descent of the notes, we even think that they might be able to associate the sound of the music with the notation. And if they do, teaching them to read music not only teaches them to read music, but gives them an insight into how we use notation to record information. I had been doing a lot of radio work for the CBC in Canada with sound. And in fact, the first thing Carl asked me to uh, comment on was the a collection of sounds he thought we should include. And uh, it seemed to me that the organizational principle, both of the sound and the pictures should be evolutionary, 
In other words, moving through things and concepts that will be more familiar to extraterrestrials because they're in the same physical universe, then moving through things more difficult like biology, and then finally through what's most characteristic human and our, and our, and our culture. So for example, later in the sound sequence, when human uh, sounds were introduced, I suggested that we use the sound of the human heartbeat as a kind of an index uh, icon. So you'll notice when humans are introduced, the heartbeat underlies the first several human sounds. And this is supposed to indicate that this sound somehow is characteristic of, uh, of humans, whether they'll know it's a heart, they probably won't, but as I put in my proposal, at least it ensures that a human heart will beat forever in space. And when it came to the images, I tried to organize them along the same lines, moving through geology and meteorology and up through biology and finally through culture. Because this was done before the internet, we couldn't do image searches the way you can now. So what we had to do was literally go through stacks of books and magazines. And I made a big chart on the wall where I would write down candidates, where they were from, one of the most amazing numbers associated with this project is the time we had to do it, which was six weeks. That was six weeks from when I got the call from Carl about, you know, attempting this thing to when we had to have the final uh, contents submitted. And we also had to get copyright clearance for everything. So it was, it was nuts. Now you might ask, how do we know that extraterrestrials will understand pictures? And that's a whole discussion. The short answer is cast shadows. Cast shadows are a natural and universal way that three-dimensional objects are transferred into two-dimensional. So we think that uh, uh, that concept of moving three dimensions into two dimensions will be something that even if they don't do it, will make some sense. And I also decided for a number of the pictures, I drew silhouettes that would emphasize the figure ground contrast. In other words, in this picture, we don't want them to be looking at the arrangement of, uh, of shrubs or of pebbles. That's not what's interesting in this picture. This is what's interesting, the figures and what they're hunting. So we tried to emphasize that. And by teaching them to look at pictures, we hoped it would make it easier for them to, uh, to understand them. And in the same kind of way that we tried to teach music, we tried to give an idea of books. The physicist Philip Morrison from MIT suggested this page from a book by Isaac Newton, where for the first time in history, it's shown how you launch a cannonball into orbit. And the fact that some of these, num these letters also appear in the text may also be a clue as to the nature of this uh, writing. And that's uh, my thumb forever turning the page. And then that's followed by the principle in action, a launch actually similar to the Voyager launch and an astronaut in orbit. And then, as I say, we tried to show a lot of pictures of things we think they would have familiarity with. We know there are islands in the riverbeds of Mars, so we know islands are universal, as are deserts and dunes and mountains and rivers and clouds. Now, we think that they will be able to recognize the images of all these things. And I think they'll be able to recognize the sounds associated with these things as well. Because if you know the characteristics of the atmosphere, which we tell them, and you have the same shapes and the same materials, you're going to make the same sounds. Just as if you pluck a string, it's going to make the same sound. If you move air over a mountain covered with snow, it's going to make the same sound. So acoustic analysis of the sounds may in fact be an easier uh, decoding proposition for them than the images. And by matching the sequences, not one for one as I would like to have if we had had more time, but at least conceptually should help the sounds reinforce the understanding of the pictures and, and vice versa. Now biology is a lot trickier but a lot of biology also follows the form follows function dictum. So the streamlining of organisms in water may be something that they recognize. And the shapes of uh, wings, for example, may also be uh, a strong clue as to, as to their function. 
And I would imagine that the sound of vibrating wings is going to be another universal sound, whatever the biology of the creature having the wings. And I also tried to build in a lot of recurrent motifs, such as the hand-eye coordination and uh, that the eyes are, are organs of vision. Well, every picture tells a story and you could really try to milk every picture for a lot of information, uh, not only the primary level of information of, of, of nursing, but let's say the secondary informations of a uh, of fabric design and jewelry. So every picture tells, tells a lot. For example, the battlements on the Great Wall of China here may be the only clue in the message to, to war. Otherwise, what are these battlements for? They're not on this side. Who knows? And some pictures actually tell a story when you put them together. For example, how we eat, how you find a fish, you catch it, you cook it, you see it's getting blacker on the grill and you eat it. And we show eating in other pictures as well. Another interesting thing about this picture is this man's open mouth. Maybe a clue that the mouth is an airway, a very important concept if they want to understand the speech and the song, the human voice that appears in the music. Here's another clue that the mouth is an airway. This man is uh, smoking a cigarette. I liked it because the glasses could be seen as lenses and another confirmation of the eyes as organ of visions. I did ask Carl if he had a problem that the man was smoking hash. Uh, Carl just laughed and said, don't tell NASA. And then a lot of technology can be understood by its form as well, such as the form of radio telescopes in the Netherlands and the giant telescope at Arecibo, which unfortunately was destroyed uh, recently and, and will be mourned by everybody who loves radio astronomy. Here's a painting I did. It's not on the golden record, but just a painting I did. This uh, antenna structure up here when you look at it from below, it looked to me like some wonderful alchemical symbol. And uh, so I put it against the Milky Way in this uh, sort of tribute to Arecibo. Well, we finished the record and it was launched into space. A friend of mine sent me this display he saw on a hiking trail in the Alps, I guess, because one of our pictures is from the Alps. And the one thing that's happened is that uh, if you have a piece of the record, you know, the man from Honduras is now famous in Honduras. And uh, if, if you have a piece of it, it's, it's become kind of adopted by whoever it represents. Well, the voyagers will leave the realm of the solar system and basically wander forever in space. For the first uh, few billion years, they'll be following an orbit that takes them around the galaxy, everything revolves around the center of the galaxy. The whole disk is spinning, as you might imagine. But things don't move smoothly. They go in these kind of sinusoidal, sinuousy paths. And in fact, the lifetime of the record is going to be determined by how much abrasion there is by the dust it encounters on that path. But these things will last for uh, many, many, well, so the spacecraft themselves, the metal parts will last for billions of years and whether they'll be found or not is really, it's really a matter of beachcombing. The galaxy must be, if there are a lot of civilizations, the galaxy must be full of derelict spacecraft and junk, just like the orbits around Earth are filled with space junk now. So maybe there are people with the uh, incentive and the machinery to go beachcombing in the depths of space and uh, We'll turn it up someday, we just don't know. Uh, the biggest factor to erode the records is dust. Every so often a microparticle of dust will hit the, hit the surface of the box and make a tiny crater. And how long does it take for that gentle sandpapering to wear through? Well, this painting shows the earth and the sun passing through this giant cloud of dust. And in fact, the galaxy is filled with dark clouds of dust. And when you pass through them, the uh, impact rate is greatly going to increase. So how many of these clouds we pass through will determine the lifetime of the record. But conservative estimates put the lifetime before the box is uh, worn through at a billion years, a thousand million years. 
And then it may be another thousand million years for the outward facing side of the record to be worn. But after that, things get more benign. What happens is we're now we're talking in time periods of billions of years that our galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are on a collision course. The stars won't collide, space is too empty, but the tidal forces may eject either or both of the voyagers far out of the realm of the galaxies into the even emptier realm of interstellar intergalactic space where they may survive for periods measured in trillions of years. Ultimately, all of the galaxies in the universe will sort themselves into giant super galaxies which will eventually burn out. Uh, but now we're talking about a period of many trillions of years. The record itself will probably be long since torn to bits. The diamond stylus should survive though. And if we had put a message on that, now that would have been something that really might have lasted. But the current estimates for the lifetime of the interfacing side of the record where all the pictures and sounds and a third of the music are, is 100,000 trillion years. Think about that. Well, if anybody finds it, is there any possibility that the music we put on it would be of any uh, interest to them? I've uh, given the argument for why the nature of sound is driven by physics, but another thing that's in art that's a driver is symmetry. And we find symmetry all through art. And I find as an artist that a lot of the symmetries in art are based on symmetries in nature. Uh, one of the more common ones is radial symmetry. And here are just some examples of how radial symmetry, which basically means things coming out radially from a center. We see in ray craters on the moon, in rays coming out of galaxies and nebulae and in diffraction patterns of x-rays and just all through the physical world. And artists have always copied that. And we see radial symmetry present through cultures that have had no contact with each other. And they weren't deriving it from one another. They were just coming on it independently because it just seemed something so built into the natural universe. Another example of that is the so-called golden section, the ratio phi or phi, which is built into Fibonacci numbers, Pascal's triangle. Uh, you find it in geometry, the number of reflections of, in multiple planes of gas or Fibonacci numbers. Uh, you find them all through nature. They can be used to construct this beautiful logarithmic spiral. And just like radial symmetry, we see it replicated in the natural world and artists have always used it as a proportion in art. So my contention is if we find these natural and widespread symmetries appealing, perhaps aliens will as well. In fact, in my view, the universe is just a nested series of symmetries that all link in one great chain of being all resonating harmoniously. And in my painting, I put a musician as being the kind of linchpin that holds the macro and the micro together. Since we share the same cosmos with anybody who finds the, uh, the record, one might suspect that these same cosmic symmetries and the kinds of things we've noticed will be present in their music. If they have anything corresponding to music, I would be surprised if it didn't have some basis in things like the Pythagorean harmonies, the length of strings that determine an Aeolian harp, or wind chimes. I bet wind chimes are going to be on every planet. Whatever the biology of beings that made them, their length is going to be determined by that same physics of sound. And I would also imagine that simple pentatonic melodies and chord triads would be something else musicians would stumble on. And also things like fret ratios. I mean, did you ever wonder why the frets get narrower as you go up the neck? And that's true whether it's a Chinese pipa or this variety of a Portuguese ukulele. And uh, it's the physics that drive that. Uh, ergonomic considerations will determine how the rest of the instrument is shaped. But if you wanna make stops and have anything like uh, harmony, you have to space your frets that way. That's not arbitrary. The Luthier on Alpha Centauri is going to face the same constraints as the Luthier here. 
If I were to suggest what music would be most accessible to them and what music of theirs would be most accessible to us, I would say, well, let's concentrate on music that doesn't require an emotional response because emotions are hormones that drive our bodies to do things. And that's how it works here. It may not work that way elsewhere. Similarly, the way uh, Tempe, you know, fast music is exciting and slow music is sad. That may have a lot to do with the way our heart beats. So those kind of responses, I think, may be particular to us. But I would look for structure where there's a clear division between a soloist playing against an ensemble or where there's a theme that then has variation. And then highly structured forms like fugues and canons or the, the magic they make with scales and ragas or in polyrhythmic drumming where you have beats of very different kinds somehow uh, working together and making a beat that's a, a kind of a moray pattern of the, of the various beats. So those are the things I think will be understood. You don't have to know about our culture to understand them. Also, if you were going to use music that had some reference, then maybe reference to things that we share. We have, as you know, if you've studied it, a musical piece by uh, Willie Ruff at Yale, which was a musical depiction of the solar system as varying pitches that were, uh, that corresponded to their, uh, their periods. And similarly, I suppose, if you feel that programmatic music about the sea is expressive of the sea, uh, we do in fact have one piece aboard called Flowing Streams, a very ancient Chinese piece, which tries to depict the different moods and characteristics of a, of a stream. But having said that, we broke all the rules on the playlist for Voyager because I was just one voice out of many. And I think the major consideration was global representation. There were really two audiences for Voyager, the audience on earth that would know about it and the audience in space that might find it. I was much more concerned about the alien audience, but I think that most of the rest of the team, except for Frank, uh, were more concerned with the earth audience. So global representation was important. And if you want music that you know, shows Earth, the sunny side of Earth and humans being nice to each other, you couldn't have picked the worst piece. I mean, the first words out of her mouth are about hellish rage, you know, consumes her. And uh, the Queen of the Night asked Pamina to kill Sarastro, who in some interpretations is her father. So Mozart breaks all the rules, but on the other hand, you can get away with it if you're Mozart. Well, the Voyager playlist was just one. If you were going to do this project again, what other playlists might you have? Well, you could do it chronologically. You could try to show the development of music throughout the world as instruments were introduced and different concepts. Or you could do it in a straight, almost instructional way. You start with scales, you know, you start with intervals, you build in simple harmonies and you move up and you finish with the whole box art of few. You can do it geographically, and that's basically what we did in Voyager, selecting world music. Of course, the danger there is unless you have unlimited capacity, who you exclude becomes as important as who you include. We had music all throughout history. Some people have said, why not show what people listen to now? Well, you know, so send world pop, just take the top, you know, song from every country in the world on a certain week from A to Z. And uh, that would be the best representation of what people in the world want to listen to. Or you could organize it by instrument. You know, maybe that would be the most understandable way for them. So, or maybe you have some original piece. Why, why confine it to existing pieces? Now we could have, you know, the possibility of a real, of a world jam, you know? So the real question is who chooses? Who's going to make this kind of decision for the next thing we, we send into space? And my feeling is that at this point, I think everybody should make the decision. There are only five spacecraft that have left the solar system, the two Voyagers and before them, the two pioneers. And then NASA's New Horizon mission, which flew past Pluto 
uh, a few years ago, this, this image shows its position in 2013 when I started working with the project. They were launched without a golden record, which struck me as a tremendous omission because now we're sending a spacecraft without a message. What message does that send? But it wasn't too late. I said, well, we can't put a golden record on it, but why don't we make a digital golden record and send it up and put it in the computer memory? It won't last as long as the record, but if you do it right, it could still last a million years or so. And the beauty of it, instead of John Lomberg and Carl Sagan and Frank Drake picking the pictures, you could let the whole world pick the pictures. You crowdsource it. You make it an internet project, you see what music people think we should send, what pictures people think we should send. They're voted on, and it's a very democratic uh, way of doing it. And at first, NASA loved the idea, but then they got cold feet, I think, because they were afraid of you know, what, people, what people might send. They could still do it. They just have to decide to do it. But doing it in software also would allow a lot of a lot more links between images. So for example, in uh, the preliminary conceptual design for it, you might have a good part of it dedicated to a high resolution globe of the earth. And then every other picture and every other sound content, whether it's a natural sound or music, could be tagged to where on earth it came from and the sound of an animal could be tacked to its image. So there could be a lot more uh, cross-referencing and different stories that could be told, pathways through the material that could be constructed. So if there were going to be future golden records, I would suspect that this will be more the direction that they'll take, even though the analog record has the beauty of, of surviving for so long. But I want to conclude by a great quote by a science fiction author, we don't really know what aliens were like. We don't know if the divisions we make between music and thinking and language and you know whether it's all the same to them or part of some larger category that we don't even suspect. But all we can do is the best we can. And I guess the thing that I'm most grateful for looking back on Voyager after 43 years is nobody seems to feel we blew it. You know, it would have been an easy thing to really screw up and I'm glad we didn't screw it up. And I still listen to the music that's on it uh, often and still think it's wonderful music. And yes, there are a million other playlists you could send, but this was a good playlist to send. And I'm very touched that so many years after I did this project of my youth that people are still interested in it. Thank you.